Hello, um, I'm Harper. Uh, one of the reasons I like to speak in public is to gain Twitter followers, and it's actually an, inc an incredibly inefficient way of gaining Twitter followers, but I'm at Harper on Twitter. I would love to continue the discussion um, for the next couple days, after my talk, etc. and feel free to hit me up on Twitter and follow me, of course. Um, today I'm going to talk about one thing, really, um, a very simple thing, teams. I want to talk to you guys about kind of how I build teams, some of the stuff that we do to build teams. Um, but before we get into that, I want to talk about my favorite thing in the entire world, myself. Um, how many of you guys know who these guys are? A good fair, a fair number? Good, good. So this is Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. Um, this is also my first computer. They also gave me a laser. Be careful. Um, so this is my first computer. Um, how many of you guys have read this book? Okay, good. So this is a really good book. I read this book when I was like 13. Um, I was programming on that Apple IIc. Um, I hadn't really learned that you could save the basic programs. Um, took me a while to get that. Um, but I was reading this book and I, I learned something. I, I really like this idea of hacker, like this idea of sharing, openness, collaboration, this idea of the hands-on imperative, all this really cool stuff. And I realized when I was about 13 that for the most part I am a hacker. How many hackers are here? Quite a number of hackers. I was really excited. Um, I, you almost raised your hand, so you're, yes, good. Um, how many coders are here? Okay, good. So I'm also a coder. That's, I, I, what do you, I guess I was, I'm classically trained, so to speak. Um, spent a lot of time programming. Um, and a bunch of time passes, and I, I, I find this company. Does anyone here know Threadless? Okay, good. So Threadless was a t-shirt company. One of the exciting things about Threadless was we apparently invented crowdsourcing. We had no idea we were doing this. Um, we went to this company, or this, not company, this place, MIT, um, at this conference, and they were like, and here's Threadless, they invented crowdsourcing. And we were like, crowd what? We had no idea what they were talking about. It was very simple for us, because what we were doing is we were taking this and turning it into that. That was very easy, and really with, with very four simple steps. Um, the steps were people like you were designing things, then you were submitting them, um, you would then score them, and then cash money would fall from the ceiling. This is a very simple four steps. Really what this did is it really took all these, these great people, all these great designers, and it put them together to create these designs that were then scored, submitted, etc. cetera. Um, we then facilitated the hard part, which was taking money. And then the easy part was giving all these great products out. It worked out pretty well. We had about 100,000 designs that were uploaded in my time there. Um, millions and millions of votes. Millions of t-shirts were sold. And we grew from X to XX. I keep getting in trouble for talking about revenue, so X to XX will have to work. The best part, though, is we did none of the hard work. All we did was focus on building this great product. Um, our technology stack was pretty straightforward for 2005, 6, 7, 8, and 9, PHP and APC, MySQL. Um, it was easy and understood, and that allowed us to focus on the product. We didn't have to worry about our tech breaking down. We just were able to focus on building these great t-shirts. Um, around 2009, I realized that I had accomplished all my goals, so I did the one thing that I think we should all do today. I quit my job. Who's here to quit your job? <laughs> Let's see some hands. Okay. If your boss is here, I'm sorry. Um, this was a great time for me because I went on what I like to call a vision quest. Do you guys know what a vision quest is? Okay, a few of you. So a vision quest is when you go into the desert with a bunch of peyote. I did not do that. Um, I joined a venture capital firm, which I think is largely the same thing. Um, and at this venture capital firm, I had this opportunity to really look and see all of these great companies, hear these pitches, learn about how to build a company, all this really fun stuff. Um, and then out of nowhere, this guy found me. Not Barack Obama, this guy. Um, this guy's name is Michael Slaby. Michael Slaby was a CTO in 2008 um, for the Barack Obama election campaign. Um, and Michael Slaby, as you can see here, this is how he dresses at like 3 a.m. on a Saturday night, um, also on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Sunday. Um, anyway, he's a really great guy. He's exactly what a progressive looks like in the U.S., so very much a dem democratic political operative. Really smart, really aggressively smart. Um, and then, in 2008, he was hired as CTO. He managed all the tech for the, CTO, uh, for the Barack Obama campaign in, in 2008. And then, in 2012, this guy shows up. Now, let's just go back real quick. <laughs> so, now the joke here is that, you know, if you look at the media narrative of this transition here, 
Um, in 2016, they're going to have a homeless guy, <laughs> apparently. Anyway, so I was a CTO in 2012. Now, what was exciting about this thing, or well, it wasn't exciting for me, was um, a lot of people, this is a great slide. A lot of people were like, why Harper? And I was like, what do you mean, why Harper? And they're like, well, I mean, why you? And I was like, come on, mom. And that was kind of how it always was. Well, the real reason why Harper, you have to go back and look at 2008 versus 2012. In 2008, the Barack Obama campaign was a startup. They had no idea if they were going to have the funding to survive. They had no idea if they were going to have the votes to survive. They had no idea if they had the candidate to survive. Um, but it turned out that they had all of those things, and they made it. In 2012, we were the Microsoft of campaigns. Um, we were this giant organization. We knew we were going to be a billion-dollar campaign. We knew we needed a software to run a billion-dollar company. And so, of course, I was the first choice, right? <laughs> um, but the thing is, is that they realized that they needed engineers to do engineering, whereas before, campaigns were just full of 24-year-old people that were doing anything. Um, there was just a pile of them, and you take the first one and you'd apply it to the first job that was there, and that, for the most part, worked, and they were all volunteers. But when you have a billion-dollar campaign and you know it's going to be this giant enterprise, you really need to attack it with the right problems and the right solutions. Um, so they found me, and they said, hey, why don't you do this? Why don't you hire all these great people? Um, we hired people from all over the place. We had about 40 engineers. Um, some of the companies we hired from, obviously, this is the most important company. Um, we had about 120 tech staff total. Um, the exciting thing about that, that's about 10 times the tech staff that the campaign had had before in 2008. We started from absolutely zero. So when I walked into the campaign, I stepped in there, and I said, okay, where's your source code from 2008? And they were just like, what source code? And I was like, well, you have to add source codes. So there was code somewhere. Um, and they were like, I don't know what you're talking about. And I'm, I'm pretty sure they burnt it in some victory dance thing, because I just don't understand how you could have something that's very similar over and over again and not have the code, and they had no code. Um, the other property here was that it was going to last 18 months, which in retrospect is a very short amount of time, but seemed like forever when we started. Um, and so because of these properties, we had to focus on one thing, and really one thing only, which was execution. Um, this is a cake that was made by one of my engineers um, right before election day. And uh, the funny thing about this cake is he brings it in, and he sets it down, and he's like, I brought cake. And everyone's like, yay, cake. And they go up, and they look at it, and they're like, well, we can't eat this, because what if we fuck it up? We're all very superstitious at this point. Um, and so, you know, a couple weeks go by, we end up winning the election, and then they eat the cake, which is way more sketchy, I thought. Um, <laughs> So, because we're focusing on execution, we had to build this platform. Um, and, you know, a lot of times in technology we talk about platforms, and we really meant it. That we had to build this giant platform to support the products that we knew we needed to make. Um, the platform was called Narwhal. Um, we named it that because we thought it was going to be this thing that no one would pay attention to. Um, the political press in the U.S. really paid attention to it because it was actually called Narwhal, which was a mistake on our part. Um, oh, here is uh, Jim Messina, who is my boss, photoshopped as a Narwhal. Here he is as Harry Potter. Um, the campaign was really stressful. Every single day was stress, just pure stress. And so anytime we had a chance to make it a little bit fun by photoshopping our boss as various animals, um, we would do so. This is my favorite version. This is him as a giraffe. Um, and this is his favorite version because I think he felt himself more of a dragon. Um, but we did that every, every meeting we had, a, we had. We had a Photoshop to Jim Messina. So anyway, Narwhal. Narwhal was this concept, right? It was this giant platform. Um, it was an API, really, that allowed us the foundation to focus and the freedom to focus on the products that were most important. Um, the products we made were these products, call tool, dashboard, mobile, um, contribution, social, and big data. Um, call tool, most of these are illegal in Germany, by the way, um, which is because the data rules. I always found that interesting. Sorry, EU. Um, anyway, the call tool is a really cool tool. What it allows you to do is it allows you to look at a list of people that you should call to get them involved with something. So whether that is getting them to, to contribute money, whether it is getting them to go to an event, or more importantly, because it's US politics, getting them to turn out and vote. Um, and so this was a really neat tool that people like you could log into, look at all these numbers, call someone with your cell phone, and immediately get them activated. The dashboard was a tool, was kind of like an enterprise business management tool. Um, really what it did is it allowed people to log in, see the people around them that were also working on the campaign, um, communicate with them, participate with them, and then get things done and then track progress. Our mobile apps were very cool. 
Um, we had Android and iOS mobile apps, but that's actually not the innovation. The innovation for us was 100% of our apps, internal and external, were all responsive. Um, because we had 5,000 staff members internally and we had about 4 million volunteers externally. And we had no idea who those people were coming from, what devices they had. And so we knew that all of our software had to work on all of their phones. And the easiest way for us to do that was to invest heavily in responsive web design. Our contribution apps were pretty good. We raised about $650 million online. Um, I think a team of about 10 people were responsible for building that. Um, so a pretty good ROI. Social media is kind of boring, I think. Do you guys think social media is boring? There you go. Um, what about big data? Do you guys like big data? OK, who here likes big data? Yes, the guy who doesn't like social media likes big data. That's not a surprise. Um, so one of our innovations was big data. Let's talk about big data for a second. I want to have a little bit of an intervention. So big data is bullshit, OK? The reason is because of the big. When you see big up there, all that is is an oracle or one of these big companies trying to sell you storage. Storage is a solved thing. We have more storage in our phones and our iPods and any of this stuff than we, have, we had a couple years ago in many of our big storage clusters. The thing here that's exciting is data. That's the thing that's exciting. We shouldn't be falling into this, this, this marketing hype of big. We should be falling into the marketing hype of questions and answers. How do we start talking about that? So when you guys are talking about big data, when someone says, are you excited about big data? You should say, no, I'm excited about big answers. And I'm excited about big questions. And so how do we get into that? That's the thing that I'm excited about. So going back, the innovation here was the data. And the data was really exciting. And the media was very excited about the data. So let's look at this. OK, here's a Google search I made. Um, Obama campaign data. Now, uh, this one's kind of boring, so let's do it. Let's make it a little more exciting. Let's add micro-targeting there. You guys know what micro-targeting is? Okay, we'll go over it a little bit in a second. So micro-targeting here, but let's just zoom in. Enhance. I have no idea what nuclear codes mean. Also, this is a horse on a boat with a cat. Um, this is the best picture on the internet. Um, so what do we take away from here is that micro-targeting micro is super exciting. I have no idea why it's so exciting, but everyone loves it. Um, this guy, Dan Sinker, tweeted this in 2008. Um, this slide just represents that we send a boatload of email. I'm sure some of you even in here accidentally got email. It's like, like a shotgun. Um, so much email. At times, we had full list sends 10 times a day, hundreds of millions of emails sent. It was a really exciting thing. Um, it worked out very well. And so whenever someone's like, well, will email survive? The answer is probably yes. Um, here's an email that we sent. This is an email that I actually received um, with some micro-targeting in it. Um, here's the exciting part, that 56 bucks. The thing about that 56 bucks for me is I'm like, why is it out of order? That's the thing that always drove me crazy. But the real thing is, is that 56 bucks being there first meant that I was going to click on it immediately and give $56 to the campaign. Um, another thing, another property of this is that the moment I clicked on it, the money was taken out of my credit card. There was no, did you mean to? Are you sure? Um, because we found that if we added that, people would say, oh, actually, I didn't mean to, or I'm not sure. And so if we just take away that uncertainty and say that the intent is in the click, then we get a lot more money. And I think that, was that, that increase was about $250 million. Um, so funnel conversion, right? Here's another one. So we added Facebook to the front of it, and you guys have all seen this before. Um, and we said, hey, log in with Facebook. So you'd log in with Facebook. We'd crawl some of your data. And I'm pretty sure that we crawled a lot of your data. Um, and then here's another email that we, that we would send out. This is another one that I, that I actually received. Um, the exciting thing here is here. So this says basically, hey, Harper, your friend John is in North Carolina, and you should remind him to vote. Um, now, what we did is we went through my friends on Facebook. We found the ones that. We all have these friends, right? The ones that like every single post. And then you have the friends that you actually are in photos with. And we found the intersection between those two friends, and we said, OK, so this is a real friend because you're in photos with them. You're influencing them because they're liking every post. So maybe, using some extra modeling and some math, we can start to determine who you influence, who's a real friend, and who's a very close friend. And so the exciting thing here is that John, up here on the screen, is actually one of my best childhood friends. And he lives in this battleground state that's so important for us to win. 
And so we were able to use this technology to simply say to me, why don't Harper, why don't you call John? Which is much more exciting than if the campaign calls John or someone else calls John. Um, and this worked very well. Um, we also did it with SMS. Um, SMS in the US is not used as much for marketing and whatnot, so we were able to get a lot of lift. Everyone opens these. Um, this is an exciting thing. Um, when, I, when we first built this, I was very sure that we were gonna make some mistakes, and so I was almost certain that it was gonna end up like this. Um, turns out, no, it didn't end up like that. It was so successful, we used it on New Year's, and I promise you it actually was like this, um, which is absolutely true. Um, the thing about this stuff is it allowed us to raise boatloads of dollars. Um, it really allowed us to do better content distribution, and the most important thing was more efficient voter contact. Um, the technology that we used to do all this stuff was pretty straightforward. Um, obviously, all these guys, we added everything else. Um, MySQL, and then all of these things. One note, oh my god, is not a storage engine. Um, you guys are welcome to make it so that I can change this and say, yes, it is a storage engine. Um, we use StatsD and Graphite. Does anyone here use StatsD or Graphite? Okay, good. It's one of the best things ever for measuring performance. Um, it really allowed us to understand what was happening in our infrastructure. Um, we used Puppet and Vagrant for development, and we used Ubuntu because we are adults. Um, we called this the OFA framework. We called this framework the Use All the Things framework. Um, and we basically just tried to use all the things. Now the reason for that, well, let's get into infrastructure real quick. On the infrastructure side, it was very straightforward. A lot of cloud, as you can imagine. Um, we had about 200 products that were deployed weekly. Um, this is our infrastructure diagram. Probably looks familiar. Um, we had thousands and thousands of servers. Here's actually our infrastructure diagram. Now, there's one of my favorite parts is gonna come up here in a second. Hold on a sec. Just a second. Okay, right there, staging and testing. So those are exact copies of what you just saw zoom by. Um, and so we were able to use this because our infrastructure at this point was software. We were able to say, just make a copy of what is in production, we'll call that staging, or just make a copy and this will be testing. Um, we actually, because there was almost a hurricane, or there was a hurricane that was almost destructive for us, we had to migrate everything from the east coast of the US to the west coast of the US um, in a day. Um, we could not have done that without the cloud. It was pretty awesome. Um, for those tech-inclined people in the audience, this is basically what we did. Um, it was pretty exciting. Um, the DevOps team that managed all this infrastructure was four people. Um, and we just were able to do it because, it, once again, it was software. Um, so we required the cloud. The main thing here is we could never have afforded all this infrastructure before um, because we didn't know what we were going to do when we did it. Now, all of this technology was great because it allowed us to focus on the problem instead of focusing on solving the problem. Um, it allowed us to understand how to build this because fail failure, honestly, was not an option. Um, a couple things we invested in. The first one was user experience. Are there any user experience people in the audience? Okay, so maybe not a lot. Um, this is always kind of depressing for me because oftentimes I ask this. How many user experience people out there? Okay, let's ask this differently. How many of you have users? Okay, so we should all be user experience people, first of all, but we also need to really invest in this. We were the first campaign that had a user experience director, someone who was dedicated to the user experience of interfacing with the campaign through software. Um, and this was baffling because all of our world is users and constituents, and we're the first time that someone invested that in politics in the US, and we felt that this should have been invested in years and years ago, and so I really challenge um, all of you guys who didn't say they're user experience people, but that have users to think, how can you interact with the users more? Because I think that's the thing that's lacking. Um, we also did a lot of testing, so much testing. We did this thing called game day, where we practiced failure for an entire month. All of October, we went and we broke 100% of our infrastructure. Um, the exciting thing about this was the campaign was very interested in doing this constantly. We had mock election days with thousands and thousands of people. Um, we had a lot of testing of our infrastructure. Um, this was a really exciting thing for us. On election day, for the most part, things were really chill. We could obviously make no more changes. Um, this was a uh, sticky note that I found um, on election day. I did learn the definition of the word frenetic. Um, it was a good day, um, but for the most part, pretty chilled out. Um, obviously, we won, um, and you're welcome that we didn't destroy the world all the way yet. Um, so 
Let's talk about teams. But first, I'm going to get some water. So the innovation with all of this was the team. One of the things that we invested early on was the team. How do we get the team there? And when you look at the campaign, or you look at, honestly, any successful company, startup, et cetera, oftentimes the innovation is very much the team. It's the people that created this thing. It's the people that work together to do this. It's never the technology. Rarely is it the solution. We often talk about how important execution is, and the people are the ones that are executing. Um, but it's not easy to build that team. Um, and so I wanted to share with you some of my rules that I've used for the past couple years to build teams, especially in really crazy environments like a campaign. Um, so the first one here is probably the hardest, which is pruning, just to jump right in. Um, pruning really is, you know, you can't be afraid to fire people. Um, and this is first because I think it is actually the hardest thing about building a team. And one thing I'd like to remind everyone is that when you fire someone, that doesn't mean that you're killing them. And I say this entirely truthfully because you may hire them again in a minute. You may hire them again in a, in a couple years. Um, there are people that we've let go that haven't fit for this team, but you know, two weeks later fit for this team. Um, there was someone on the campaign that we hired that we'd actually let go previously at Threadless. They were great. Um, they just didn't fit Threadless right then. They fit the campaign perfectly and were a huge help. And so this is a really important concept for me to remember personally is that sometimes it doesn't work right now, but that doesn't mean it won't work in the future. And so when you're firing someone or when you have to part ways, you have to remember that you're not burning a bridge, you can't burn that bridge, you can't afford to, because you know this person, it's a known quantity. So how do you keep that person on your team, so to speak? How many people have seen this movie? Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross? I don't even know how to say it. Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross? I've never seen it, um, but apparently it says ABC, which is a really big thing. Always be closing, right? Um, I'm going to challenge that because we always talk about how well we have to always close, we have to always be closing. But the exciting thing here is always be creative. When you're talking about jobs, when you're talking about building a team, we oftentimes see these posts on the internet, and we see this, right? Rails engineer one. That's not very inspiring. Who here wants to be a Rails engineer one? Right? But, who, but what if it says, how would you like to save the world by being a Rails engineer on my team? Wee! That's much more exciting. Um, for the campaign, it was easy, right? We were like, how would you like to not destroy the world? Um, and they were like, oh, yeah. Or I'd say, the president wants you to work for them. And they would say, OK. Um, so that was easy for us. But how do we make it easy for everyone else? Um, there's another ABC thing here. Um, A's hire A's and B's hire C's. Do you guys know this one? Um, this is a really good one. So how many of you are A's? OK, that's good. We have a few A's. Um, we're going to have to work on that one. Um, the exciting thing about this is a lot of this stuff is from Rumsfeld's Rules, which is a book by Donald Rumsfeld, who is ideologically opposed to me, I think, probably. Um, but the idea behind A's Hire A's is very simple, right? It's just hire people who are smarter than you. Um, this is one of my most favorite things to do, because you hire someone, and you're like, hey, I want you to do this thing. And they're like, I love doing that thing, first of all, and I'm very good at it, and I'm way better than you at doing it. And I'm like, that's good, because I don't want to do it. And that's the exciting thing. So you just hire these people to do all the things that you don't want to do because they love doing it and they're very smart and good at it. Um, and actually, I'm terrible at it. So it's good to have them do it. Um, trust. Trust is a big one. And I don't have anything silly to say about trust because it's really important. Um, it's one of the most important things for building a team and you just kind of have to figure out how to facilitate trust, how to build trust, and how to enable trust. Um, measuring everything, um, I showed StatsD and Graphite earlier. This is one of the graphs that came out of that. One of the things about StatsD and Graphite is it really allowed us to measure everything, every single thing. Um, but what that measurement did is it allowed us to understand what was success. Because understanding what is success allows you to celebrate and give credit. Um, there's this great idea of blameless postmortems. Um, but sometimes it really works well for a team to actually give credit where credit is due, to say, look, this was very successful. This team did a great job. This person did a great job. And without that measurement, you can never understand what success is or give that credit. Authenticity is another really big one for teams. Um, we had this guy named Charlie on our team at Threadless. Um, and Charlie, at first, was really annoying because all Charlie did was tell us we were wrong. Um, turned out that Charlie was the most authentic member of our team in regards to Threadless. He was the person that could blend in with any Threadless user. So whenever we were building something that didn't quite fit in, Charlie was able to say, hey guys, that didn't quite fit in. That doesn't quite make sense for the context of our team. 
Um, and having him there we allowed us to really understand what the user is, who the user is, what the user is doing, and why they are doing it. Um, and that really helped our team grow and bolster our team. It was really great. Purpose is another really big one. Um, here's a picture of the president signing the American Health Care Act, because apparently health care is a new thing for us. Um, it's a pretty exciting thing, an opportunity for us, and this was something that really pushed the team. Every time these things happened, the team got faster, better, more everything. But the most important thing, or one of the most important things for a team um, is diversity. This is one of the things that we struggled, I think, the most with on the campaign. Um, all the people that came out of the campaign have gotten better at this. It's exciting to watch them. What this has allowed us to do is really focus on growing the innovation inside of our teams. Um, by hiring people that look differently than you, you're able to have all these different cultural experiences that add up to building this product that you're building. It's really important. Um, I like to joke that it's not that hard for me to hire someone that looks different than myself. But that's a pretty big joke because it actually is easy to hire someone that looks like me in tech. Um, and that's the problem here, is that it's hard to look like someone that's a person of color or a woman um, or you know, someone who's differently abled or even older. Um, it's very easy for me to hire a 20-year-old white man. Um, and so what we need to do is we need to think about how do we fix this? I mean, I don't mean just not hiring white people. I mean, how do we fix this in a way where, how do we get all of these people in our teams to have a different cultural experience to add to the innovation that we're trying to build? This is one of the most important things for us. Um, it's not easy though, and I have two things that I kind of recommend, and I, I think these are the right things, but there might be more, and so I'd feel free to reach out and tell me where I'm right or wrong on this. Um, but the first thing is you have to try, and that's to all the people who are hiring right now, you actually have to try and step outside of that comfortable zone where it's easier to hire a red-haired dude with a beard than it is to hire a person of color or a woman. Um, one of the jokes I like to say, which is kind of depressing, really, is that apparently red-haired people are going extinct, but women aren't, so why is it easier to hire red-haired people? I don't understand. Um, the second thing here is that we have to talk about it. So we have to talk about it. So when next time you're on stage as someone hiring, talk about diversity. Don't just talk about how you've been successful, though. You have to also talk about how we've failed, because that's the important thing, and that's how we learn, is by learning about how we've tried and it hasn't worked. Um, one of my favorite experiences of this, or one of my favorite stories about this is Etsy, based in New York. They tried, they weren't very successful, so they kept iterating until they got to the point where they were actually giving scholarships to the hacker school in New York, which then offered them a great um, list of people to hire afterwards. And so they started to hire more people of color, more, more women, et cetera, and it was really exciting. Um, this is not gonna get easier if we choose to ignore it, so don't. But there's one more thing that builds a team, um, and that's shipping. And so, how many of you have a product today that they haven't shipped? I was like, no one's hands are up? What is this, fantasy tech world? <laughs> okay, so there's a few. My challenge for you today is just ship it. Let's just get it out there, I'll help. Because the thing is, is we have these fake users. When they're inside, they're these fake God users where they're all perfect and everything works. But the moment you step outside, you get this thing where suddenly nothing works, everything is wrong, oh my gosh, and then like a couple days later, it's all fine. But we'll never get there if we don't ship, and I guarantee the teams will be stronger together if we ship. So let's ship. Um, but building a team is hard, you know, it's not easy, but it's always the most important thing, and it's always the thing that's worth it. Um, so let's do it. And that's about it. Thanks, everyone. So, thank you very much, Arthur. That was um, very interesting. And I think um, Swedish politicians have something to learn from you, especially when it comes to using um, the internet to raise their campaigns and things like that. I was hoping it was beards. Ah, oh, maybe. Yeah, well, well, we're trying also to reach a 50-50 male-female mm. government, so I don't know. So it's not beards. It's not only, at least, no. no. <laughs> so, I want you to stay for another second, because um, according to the International Telecommunications Union, ITU, almost 3 billion people will soon have access to the internet. That is close to 40% of the world population. And my colleague, Rika Dahlstrand from Doresi, has made a plaque to remind us all that this worldwide community of people exchanging information is constantly growing. And here he is. This is exciting. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> 
This is great. That is a counter estimating the growth of the number of users. So the best part about this is it says hack me right there. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> That's great. Thank you very much. A warm hand for Yes, thank you. Harper. Thank you very much.